let's try something different, l'Arc de Triomphe at night. Constructed between 1806 and 1836, it honors those who fought in the name of France during the Napoleonic Wars. Later, it would honor other wars such as World War I, represented here by the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. You can actually go to the top of the structure. More specifically, walk up. 284 steps to be exact. Before arriving at the top, you first arrive in the attic, which gives a bit of history about the structure. Afterwards, you arrive at the top, which gives you a breathtaking view of Paris from one of its most central points. Paris being a flat city, it's very easy to get a great view of the surroundings, including the famous traffic circle of the Place de l'Etoile. Despite its frightening appearance, Parisians do know how to drive around this place. Traffic entering the circle gets the right of way, with the traffic already inside the circle waiting for the incoming traffic to clear up before proceeding. It's a bit of a ballet dance which works surprisingly well, with very little honking and very few arguments, but still plenty of accidents. Admission to the arch is included with your Paris Museum Pass, and it's much less crowded than the Eiffel Tower. However, you still have to walk up and down. Our next museum is the Centre Georges Pompidou, named after President Georges Pompidou, who held office from 1969 until his death in 1974. Today, it holds the city's main modern art museum. And I must admit, I have a love-hate relationship with modern art. So let's first start with the stuff I do like. A piece by Robert Delaunay. It's like a puzzle. Nice choice of colors in this piece by Henri Matisse. Another Matisse, dark and somber this time. Salvador Dali's Photoshop style, but without the Photoshop. Picasso has always been intriguing, even when he didn't finish something. I love the comic styles such as this piece by Beckman. Even in their simplest forms, they still tell a story, just like this one by Léger. Some works, such as this Miro, are a bit on the extreme, but still manage to say something, or ask a question, such as this Matin, namely, what does that black rectangle represent? This is Alice, painted by Balthus in 1933. You'll notice her breasts are lopsided, her body parts are out of proportion, she seems out of place, and she's not wearing any underwear, a combination many found very disturbing at the time. The model was easily recognized as Betty Holland, a well-known friend of Balthus, but in real life, she did not look anything like the surreal and disproportionate creature depicted in this painting, which made it even more disturbing. So why do I like it so much? It disturbed the French. That's quite an accomplishment. Now let's take a look at some of the items modern art museums are famous for. This might be a little rough. Now here's what I think of this one. The neighbors were so fed up with the piano player's lousy music, 
they all chipped in and soundproofed his apartment. No? Okay, then. My problem with modern art is that in a valiant effort to express something, too often the works don't appear to express anything at all. And while some works do try to make an effort to express something in general, maybe shout out at the crowd, or ruffle the feathers of a few sensitive souls, I still find most modern works of art to be so disorganized and chaotic that many works look either completely ridiculous or end up as junk. So on that note, let's move on. I want to show you something that has helped make Paris the classy and modern city that it is today. Public toilets. They're free and they're self-cleaning, so you never have to worry about sitting in the last person's crap. And then there's this, rental bicycles. Part of the Villib project, you purchase a pass valid between one day and one year, you grab a bicycle from one of the 1,450 bicycle stands in the city and leave it at the nearest stand at your destination. But if you keep the bike for more than half an hour, you'll be charged extra, so don't be late. Another popular mode of transportation in the city is the motor scooter. And surprisingly, they appear to be either four-cycle or clean-burning two-cycle engine models because I haven't caught a whiff of two-cycle exhaust fumes anywhere in the city during my stay. Then there's the Paris metro system. With its 214 kilometers of track, 300 stations, and 1.365 billion passengers per year as of 2005, it's the second most frequented subway network in Europe next to Moscow. The Paris Metro includes both elevated and underground tracks and stations, very often on the same line. The network is also supplemented by the rare commuter lines, helping to ease congestion during rush hour. The architectural styles of the stations are mixed, such as this elevated station with a train station roof. Others have a bathroom tiled tunnel appearance, which I find to be a bit sterile. Other more modern stations have a generic corporate look. Some stations do include some interesting artwork, such as this mural at the La Bastille station. The seating arrangements in the older cars are a bit awkward. Along with the fold-out seats which partially block access to the doors, you also have the middle seats which, due to their lack of proper handholds, could create a situation where you might fall on top of the person sitting in front of you when you're trying to get up. Guess how I learned that one? Unfortunately, like too many other networks in the world, the Paris Metro has a serious graffiti problem. There are numerous scratchings on the windows and graffiti on the tunnel walls. But surprisingly, there's hardly any graffiti in the stations themselves. As for the overall noise levels... I'm sorry, that was an exception. In most cases, the trains are reasonably quiet and some actually sound pretty sweet. Warp 5, Mr. Sulu. But there is one thing that gets on my nerves more than anything else, and that's the totally inconsistent signage used in the station entrances. The signs can be classy like this Hector Guimard display, or modern like this undistinguished yellow M in a metal hoop. Some entrances only include the line identifier, while other entrances try to hide the name Metro behind a light fixture. That is, if you can see it over the crowd. Where the heck is it? No, that's an exit. The entrance is further up, and the sign is facing the street. This one doesn't even have a sign. Is this an access to the metro, or an access to one of the city's numerous underground car parks? It was too often difficult to find a legitimate entrance to a metro station unless I already knew where it was. The network desperately needs proper signage, just like they have in London. But unlike London's excessive heat problems, the Paris Metro's major shortcomings can easily be resolved without the need to perform any major infrastructure work. Despite the signage issues, once you do find the station's entrance and you're on board the train, the Paris Metro will take you to your destination more efficiently than any other mode of transportation in the city, including this one. You know, you can always try walking. Coming up, a free view of the city, a Roman amphitheater, a canal, and a concrete wasteland.